No, I don't have to. I don't have to defend the IMF and the Asian crisis because I, I think they, I think they uh, started out making some uh, mistaken assumptions. On the other hand, 1996, fastest growing region in the world, emerging Asia. 1997 recession, 1998 recession, and the conventional wisdom, ah, you see. The Asian tigers have feet of clay, structural feet of clay, crony capitalism, blah, blah, blah. It'll be a decade before they recover. 1999, fastest growing region in the world, emerging Asia. So somebody was doing something right. So it's, uh, it's a more complex story than is, us than is usually told. Um, but in practical terms, in practical terms, uh, where, what should central banks be doing now? What should regulators be doing now that they're not doing? And or, because earlier, before you arrived, I think the general consensus was that the current macro situation is pretty, is pretty favorable and is likely to continue in the near term. That even though there were risks, I don't think that the consensus was that we're at, at the edge of a crisis. And I think if I was were to ask, there probably wasn't a consensus that a crisis is inevitable because we're on the, on the wrong track. In other words, that the central banks, that policymakers, especially the central banks and regulators, have made fundamental mistakes that make the next, that already make the next crisis inevitable. Is that, does anybody want to dissent from that? Andre. On central banks, I think in Europe at least, in the Eurozone, I think uh, we have to finish the job. The job has been done, I guess, 70% roughly, or something like that, in terms of uh, coordinating regulation, having a, a system to have a deposit guarantee uh, at the level of the Eurozone. It's well advanced, but it should be completed, because again, I guess, again, uh, Daniel's point shows it, there is again this recurring idea that European banks are weak, are sick, are full of bad loans and so on, which I really believe may be part, sometimes right, but what is true is that when it came out, it was solved, right? So we will get that out of it. The second problem we have, I don't think it's a problem for central banks. I think Bertrand put it very well. Uh, there is liquidity, there is money, and we need to have investment start again. And uh, I don't think you'll find the solution only with the banks, because the constraints today are very high. And given the very low rates today, they should have a strong incentive to lend. And they, I don't think there is a problem there. What you see is happening is, uh, on a very small scale, uh, non-bank funding, uh, which doesn't really cover the problem because it's too small, but that is growing. What you also see is banks setting up subsidiaries or new banks getting into the picture uh, with a different approach. I guess I mentioned the French telecom uh, company, Orange, which is actually more than French. Uh, as you know, in, in Asia, uh, the banking is now done basically by, by the, on cell phones. Uh, that, you know, at least payments are done on cell phones. And there's also some credit done this way. So you see new ways. Of, of funding the economy, which for the time being are very small scale, but could potentially become very, very large. And maybe that's something that central banks should be looking at. Uh, not to stop it or to control it, but to just to see can it be helped in some ways, you know, to have the system moving. Let me say what the central bank should do. Okay. I, I fully agree the central banks cannot invigorate the economies. No way. And we say banks should lend. There is not much of a demand. So ban banks are much more reluctant to lend because of the, of the history, and there is still a legacy problem. There is still, I mean, at least EU countries and your, your area countries are still very much in debt. Both public and private debt is pretty large. So there is a legacy issue. And, and the demand is not there. Not many companies are, there is not much of an appetite to borrow, so we should acknowledge it. It's not like banks want to lend, but, but uh, 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 the demand is there, but banks do not want to lend. 
it's, it's, it's it works both ways. Secondly, there are structural changes at work in the global economy, including digitization and, uh, and uh, the new technologies in general, which change the picture tremendously. And there is so much uncertainty. I mean, in which fields to invest? This is also an issue. Where to invest? There are the geopolitical risks also, which have to be uh, factored in. So it's not like we have a lot of uh, resources, but we don't know where to invest. Then th th there is still a lot of resource misallocation. When there is still a lot of resource misallocation, it's not easy to invest more. So, so uh, and, and, and last but not least, I believe that the, where the central banks should be much more clairvoyant is that they, the, the whole of finance should be regulated and supervised. The whole of finance, because there is an ongoing debate whether fintech should be regulated. And in my view, my humble view, fintech has to be regulated, because fintech can be also quite dangerous. Fintech is not only an infant industry which has to be groomed, but it can be very dangerous. <laughs> there is another point which actually has happened throughout this uh, 10 years of this, this crisis decade, uh, which is a massive shift, I would say, in, in, in the system between banks and institutional investors. I mean, I've, I've been group CFO of two banks, and before the crisis, the name of the game was to grow your balance sheet and make as much money as you could with your balance sheet. And now the growth of your balance sheet is, it, it comes with such a tremendous cost. I mean, it, it comes with capital requirement, with tax, with, so you have zero incentive whatsoever to grow your balance sheet. So it's a shift. So it, actually, it's very interesting to see that this crisis started with one of the failure of the originator distribute system in the US related to the subprime, and that the end game of the crisis is to push all banks into this originator distribute system and to put it throughout the, I mean, throughout the value chain. Uh, and so banks have really changed their roles during these 10 years, which has also an impact for the monetary policy, et cetera, the way, the way it's transmitted. Where at the same moment, institutional investors not only have grown in size, but are more and more concentrated. I mean, I, 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 I remember, I reminded people of a lunch when I, I was a young banker in New York in, in the year 2000. I was very modestly advising Larry Fink, who was CEO of BlackRock. And at that time, he was passing the $200 billion threshold. And he was kind of considered a big fixed income boutique. Well, let me put it this way. And I remember when I, I, I really were on the, on, on the, the whiteboard and he said, someday I will manage a trillion. And I said, my God, this guy is crazy. He never got, I mean, one trillion. This is just enormous. And now BlackRock is managing 5.5 trillion. And you have like 10 people which are managing between two and five trillions, which is unheard of in the history of mankind. So this is a massive shift. What consequences do we take out of this? I mean, the business model of this is people is so different. I mean, Societe Generale had 160,000 people for $1.6 trillion balance sheet. BlackRock is managing, I know it's not exactly comparable, but sort of. And BlackRock has $5.5 trillion of assets in the management. They have 12,000 staff. So the margins are not the same. It's not the people on the ground. It's a totally different world. That we are not prepared for that. So when I call for a holistic perspective, it also does take this into account. I think it's important to see who are these new players. I mean, is it good or bad that we have 20 guys managing more than one or two trillion? Can we argue that, I mean, if these people react the same way at the same moment, it will create the worst panic you can ever imagine. If 40 trillion move in the same, if, if 40 chief economists have the same analysis of the world at the same moment, is it scary or not? So you, you can be scared. You can also argue that you don't have the same level of transformation that you have in the banking system, that this, these companies actually are quite decentralized, and that behind BlackRock actually have many small, smaller shops, and they, they all make different decisions, which is probably right, actually. But you could also argue the flip side is that it's also a great opportunity to have people which have so much money at hand, because if they do it properly, they can really make a difference. So the fact that these people suddenly say, oh, climate change is important, it has an impact for us, I want to move in a low carbon economy. My God, what a leverage we have found, which did not exist before the crisis. So I think this, these are these kind of very significant shifts which we are discovering as we speak, but I don't think we've taken, I mean, drawn any consequences from what's happening. And I think for me, it's, it, it's fascinating. So I'm not, I'm not scared. Uh, again, I'm scared by, by the lack of cooperation. I'm scared by a number of things, but on the other side, we have the tools. We, we have capacity to handle things. So that's why it's, it's, it's a fascinating moment, because we can go either direction.
what can central banks do? Uh, I think uh, Lebanon has been uh, a prime example for unconventional monetary policies. I give an example about the stimulus package and its impact. There are two other examples that I can give. One is what we call the financial engineering. It was a simple swap. It wasn't that simple, but we, it's multi-level swap that reaped that turned around the situation in Lebanon, whereby banks were capitalized. So in anticipation to IFRS 9 and what one January 1st, 2018, their Basel, Basel 3 requirements is not 12 and a half, it's 15% now. And we have requested the banks to take 2% provisions as well for, on all their, uh, uh, on, on all their uh, portfolio. In addition to this, the balance of payment, because of this financial engineering tool that we have done, the balance of payment has turned around from a negative, a deficit of $1.7 billion in May 2016 into a cumulative surplus of $1.3 billion at the end of the year, at that same year. In addition to this, we were able to stack our reserves, foreign reserves, by $43 billion, $43.5 billion. So for the first time in Lebanon, in the history of Lebanon, Lebanon has come close to $44 billion over a GDP of $54 billion. So this is one of the things that we have done. Another thing that I will end up with here is what we call, we have launched the knowledge economy. In Lebanon, we, uh, we have taken advantage of the youth, the, the brains that we have in our kids, and we availed for the first time and launched the knowledge economy whereby banks do get involved in equity financing rather than giving them loans. For the first time, banks are partners because prior to this and in any other projects, banks are not allowed to get in partnership with any of their customers with the exception of the knowledge economy whereby they, are, they go in in partnership with them. So these are examples about what can central banks do. One last thing. Uh, there was some talk about compliance. At, at every single bank, not only do they have compliance departments at the hand, set, head office, they have a compliance department in every single branch. And that compliance officer should not be the one who is doing the selling or account opening or what have you. That should be some kind of a support function, someone who doesn't deal much with customers, if any. Thank you very much. If I may, I have to, to catch a plane. Is there is a question for me? Or, oh, please. Oh, so I'll so take it and then rush. Okay. Really please go ahead. Uh, okay. uh, uh, banks so in Lebanon, right. subject the to uh, Basel two or three. Three. But, well, actually, all uh, but of the capital equity uh, investment, capital charge 500% yeah. or 750%. Okay. How can banks can uh, you know extend uh, you know equity investment? To, uh, well, we have we have no choice. This is why with the financial engineering tool is actually it just we have turned the situation around and we made them capitalize. So actually, so far Lebanon and banks are the banks are the backbone of the economy. With with what's happening around us, with with all the wars all around us, with we had we had the terrorist ISIS right on the borders and, and part of that for Lebanon, they have taken some parts of Lebanon. We have Israel and our southern border, Syria on the northern and eastern border. Terrorists are all over. So this is the only thing that can give confidence. As we spoke today, now I'm attending to my phone because I'm getting so many questions from the from the journalists. What's happening with the Lebanese lira, with the Lebanese? Because Hariri has resigned today and this will have a major impact. So these are the types of things. This is why we are very keen on really uh, stocking our banks with as much uh, immunity as possible so that an issue like this, or just there are so many different issues, if another war gets waged on Lebanon, we're fine. Because what can happen in, in times like this, fortunately this came on Saturday and tomorrow is a Sunday. People immediately would just transfer their, Leb their Lebanese lira into dollars or euros or transfer them out of Lebanon, or do both. So this is why, you know, I've been in touch with the governors, what kind of statements we have to make. And on the other phone, I'm giving that statements to, to the other journalists. So these are the things that we have, we cannot afford, but be as stocky as possible, as, as heavy as possible. And you know what? We have 30% liquidity, 30% liquidity in our banks. This is a lot. We have $43.5 billion as foreign reserves at the central bank. This is a lot, you know. It's, it's costly.
just I'm part of the investment committee as well. I know exactly what that what it takes and what kind of returns we have on our on our money. It's not that fun, but we have to. This is sort of the insurance policy that we take for our banks and for the central bank as well. Thank you and good luck. <laughs> good, challenging. challenging. It's all right. Didn't break. Didn't break. Okay. Elena, Elena you wanted to speak? Just a quick um, uh, comment on your question, John, about uh, you know, how to use the relatively favorable economic condition in um, <clears throat> and what central banks could do during this time. Um, certainly, you know, we should, uh, you know, when the sun is shining, we should be taking care of the basement and the roof um, and put together, you know, from a regulatory perspective and from central bank policy perspective, um, you know, the, the policies and uh, regulation that are meaningful and sensible. Um, in Europe, uh, you know, I, I, I live in Paris now and observe and follow um, all the developments um, in, you know, south-north divide. Um, the critical issue for ECB is to phase out of uh, QE as soon as possible. And I'm, I'm a little concerned that there are, you know, timid steps uh, been taken in that direction and that people are still, you know, worried about what's going to happen. But this is the best environment economically we, we have in Europe. Uh, we will not have better. We might have worse, but, um, and also, you know, politically you know, in France there is such a um, good uh, um, atmosphere with Macron's um, um, election. So this is the time to do it uh, because the, the QE has been and kind of obfuscating the reality of uh, you know debt sustainability in in Europe, you know, from debt management expert perspective, I, it, it's mind-boggling how we would, why we would not be phasing out of it as soon as possible. So I think that at least for Europe, that would be my vote. Thank you. It seems virtually certain that central banks are going to act cautiously in the current environment. In any case, so it's. Uh, <coughs> I suppose there's some some concern, but I don't know if anybody. I, my perception was not widely shared that the, they could be precipitating uh, some kind of a of a crisis soon. Sorry, down there, you had a question. Um, I'm Salim Dahmesh from the Central Bank of Morocco, and I want to share with you some personal view on the regulatory agenda. To answer the question, what regulators should do, I think that they should complete the ambitious process that we started after the crisis. And uh, if we enumerate the initiatives, we are, they were not completed. For example, on the separation side of activities, neither Dodd-Frank or Vickers or Likanen was completed. On the banking union side in Europe, it's the same. Only, only the single uh, supervisory mechanism was uh, in place. No resolution which is completed and no uh, insurance deposit uh, at all. On the macro prudential policy side, it's a very useful agenda, but it was not fully operational. On the incentives side, there is no so much regulation of pays or bonuses, and uh, on the shadow banks, they, uh, there is taking more and more place, and it is not uh, regulated. And even from the French perspective, the tax in financial taxes was completely uh, abandoned. And I want to add some risk assessment uh, elements. Uh, the global financial uh, financial cycles uh, are interacted. Banks are even bigger than before the crisis, and the nexus between banks and sovereign is also uh, wider since banks bought so much uh, sovereigns. In addition to that, the debt level is very high. It was also the Global Financial Stability Report of the IMF told us, and we can expect some bubble signs on many segments of financial markets, from uh, real estate to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to bonds uh, and stocks. So all to, to say that if we have a crisis in the next few years, it will be more harmful because the interest rates are very low and the balance sheets are bigger by historical standards. And in addition to that, we don't have any fiscal space. And finally, the cooperation mode is not here. We know that uh, Trump appointed Randall Quartz, which is an ex-banker from the financial sphere, to as a financial regulation uh, chief. And also we have uh, Powell yesterday or, or the day before, which is from the, maybe from the bank, 
Kurds community. So, so all in addition to French uh, position regarding the harmonization of a risk uh, model uh, harmonization. So I'm very pessimistic on the future. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I was going to step back a little bit and address the question that you asked before about <clears throat> what the broader risks are. And this is not about whether central banks are doing the right or wrong thing now. I think they've been partially doing the right thing. But I think we all recognize that life's full of trade-offs and international finance is no exception that we have an integrated international financial system and if we've learned anything from the past couple of hundred years that that internet an integrated international financial system is prone to crises we don't know where the crises are likely to come from but we do know what some of the sources of weakness are um, both in theory and in practice the first is we've identified i think scholars have identified the uh, gross financial flows are typically associated with potentials for losses of confidence which then raise liquidity questions because basically there is no liquidity that can deal with a, with a loss of confidence. And that's what we learned from 2007, 2008. You know, as Gary Gorton has, I think, explained extremely well, we had a run on the bank, except that intermediation is now through the market. So instead, it was a run on the markets. And we are still in a position where markets can be run if confidence is lost. We don't know what the, what the ultimate source, what the uh, initial source will be. I don't think anyone would have expected subprime to be the particular, uh, subprime was only the tiny catalyst. I mean, there were underlying weaknesses in the international, in American, European, international financial system that subprime revealed. We don't know what might be the catalyst for a next crisis. It could be non-performing loans in in uh, China. It could be the European situation, despite what uh, Mr. Levy Langa said. I'm not entirely convinced that um, that 70% is an, I'm not sure we're at 70%. Um, I th I'd say more like 40%. Uh, I think there are real questions about whether the resolution mechanism is sufficient in, in its current form to deal with a serious crisis. Um, I think that we've got certainly some indications that when push comes to shove, national governments step in and override the agreements that have been worked out at the level of the, of the banking union and politics is going to is, is going to rear its ugly head or pretty head, whichever you may think about it, should a crisis re, uh, return. I think that there is some indication of froth in the asset, asset markets. The cyclically uh, uh, um, adjusted price to earnings ratio currently in the U.S. is double what it was at the height of dot-com boom. Um, and the debt load on the consumer side has increased continually over the last five years. I'm not sure that's cause for concern, but I'm not willing to say that it's not cause for concern. So I guess what my, my underlying point is there are sources of weakness in national, regional, and the global financial system that could, moving forward, and I'm not talking about the next three months, moving forward over the next series of years, cause difficulties. And the reason I think that's important to point out is what both Daniel and others have mentioned, which is we face, I think, a very different underlying set of conditions in the international financial order today, which is that we have an administration in Washington that is not committed to global cooperation and is not committed to the current institutional structure um, and is not committed to working together with our financial and trading partners should difficulties break out. Now, one could argue <clears throat> that the, the force of events will, will require cooperation, but I'm not so sure that things will work as well next time around as they did in 2008. And, and as we started off by saying, things went as well as could have been expected in September, October, and November of 2008. That was with uh, an administration and an income, both an outgoing and an incoming administration that seemed quite committed to global cooperation. We have an administration now which is not committed to global cooperation, um, certainly not on trade, and increasingly not on financial regulation and finance more generally, and a microeconomic policy. So I worry that if and when the next crisis comes, and it's almost certain that there will be a next crisis, that intervention by the major powers, and in particular by the U.S., will be more destructive than constructive. And that's what worries me. So you asked what worried me, that's what worries me.
So um, when I was uh, doing the forecasting at the World Bank, uh, I was, uh, uh, I suffered two crises, uh, both of which were completely unforeseen, uh, at least to the mainstream, which was the Asian financial crisis, and then the, um, uh, and then the, the, the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009. So th this experience, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong, convinced me, and we were, that's all we were doing. We were looking, I mean, just to show you our full incompetence. Uh, we, were, uh, we were looking all the time for these issues, um, and uh, maybe not as assiduously as the people at the fund, but uh, we had our job to do. And um, so that kind of convinced me that uh, uh, the next financial crisis or financial crisis in general is almost by definition, almost tautologically, is a surprise. Uh, in the sense that if it wasn't a surprise, um, it wouldn't be the crisis. I mean, people would be taking steps uh, well in advance. And what happens is when it materializes, it doesn't materialize all in one go. But it's kind of too late by the time you see it. You know, even if you see uh, before the worst happens, three months beforehand or four months beforehand, it's too late. The the uh, all the all the bad loans or whatever it is has built up and uh, and need to be correct. So, so I think uh, if you didn't, you don't need this from me. But modesty is uh, is uh, is the good guide here. Uh, one point I want to make is that uh, I have been very worried about all the quantitative easing and the low interest rates and uh, uh, et cetera, that this would actually create these, uh, another condition like this. As I scan and I, and I look, I know, right now I don't see, but of course I don't expect to see where uh, the huge problem is. Um, uh, certainly, I don't see it in the uh, equities, uh, uh, etc. Very simply because the people who are buying the equities, by and large, uh, you know, are either households or funds. They don't have the big leverage problems. It's a very transparent sort of thing. Some people will lose a lot of money. They're idiots, um, and some people will lose a lot of money who think they're very smart. But Overall, it doesn't look to me like, you know, one of these highly leveraged, highly non-transparent situations like the uh, subprime crisis. Uh, I was also worried about the emerging markets, uh, that they'd get this wall of liquidity. And there are, of course, issues in Venezuela. Uh, but uh, overall, you know, the, the capital flows to emerging markets are really quite restrained. Uh, have been quite restrained. There are a lot of things that the emerging markets has done, as they have done, as you know, flexible exchange rate, domestic bond markets, that have lessened the risk. Uh, if I was, if you push me now in very little confidence to say, where, where am I worried? Actually, I'm less worried in the markets, I'm worried in the government. And, uh, and in fact, I wanted to ask from the beginning, what is the secret? I've heard this story many times. I want to hear it again because I never understand it. Uh, what is the secret of Japan? And, uh, and uh, so do we learn from Japan that we can have 225% last time I looked uh, public debt to GDP and zero interest rates, uh, zero long-term interest rates? Do I learn from Japan that don't worry about the United States doing a 1.5 trillion additional debt in, or at least deficit, in, uh, in the new uh, tax package. Don't worry about Italy. Don't even worry about Greece. Uh, is that what I learned from uh, the Japanese experience? And as I understand it, a lot of the debt is owned in Japan, which means that a lot of the debt is also owned in the Japanese banks. And that's what I worry about. Well, the last point you made is the point that many uh, pundits, uh, you know, uh, refer to as a comforting element. I doubt it. Uh, many 
I experienced too many banking crises since 1980s. Uh, you know, Mexico, um, Brazil, Latin America, and, and the 90s, you know. Um, you know, uh, domestic holders of assets, you know, captive flight, always. So, uh, Japanese investors, they all, you know, when crisis was looming, or in the offing around the corner at least, then they start uh, selling their bonds. So, uh, you know, domestic uh, holdings of uh, JGBs will not uh, or should not be regarded as a confident element. That's my view. But why Japanese debt is so high and interest rates are so low. It's because simply because of deflationary mindset there. Deflation is there, so it will continue a long time. In the end, what, what would happen? There are only three scenarios. One is happy scenario, growing out of the debt. Japan's economy, you know, all of a sudden begins to grow very fast, sustainable basis, and uh, you know, getting rid of deflation and growing debt. That will be a happy story. Second, uh, Japanese government defaults on their promise. This is highly unlikely. Okay. Uh, even after World War II, Japanese government continued to pay out the debt they, 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 they issued at the time of Russo-Japanese War in 1905. I still remember, even in the 70s, uh, Japanese government continued to uh, you know, uh, repay the debt. Uh, the last one is hyperinflation, of course. This is a red repudiation, sort of. But, uh, so there are only three scenarios. But all those scenarios seem not an immediate uh, uh, you know, outcome. So people just hang loose. That's what it is. It's a policy recommendation. <laughs> Question way down there. Well, you, as, as Yuri said, essentially crises are unpredictable. And, uh, but here, when we were looking at the 2007, 2008 crisis, people, were at that time, 2005, 2004, worrying about a crisis happening in the emerging markets. And the crisis happened in the developed countries or in the advanced economies, and the globalization made it such that it was more global. Actually, when I hear you speaking, you, and I might understand you wrong, but you all seem to be saying that the next crisis will happen in the advanced countries and that the advanced countries would not be equipped enough or willing enough to address the causes of the crisis or to try to smooth the impact of the crisis. But what about the crisis happening in the emerging markets? Or, and, and do the emerging countries have the abilities to respond to the crisis or to do something about it? I'd like to have your opinion on that. Let's assume it goes the other way. Okay, I have an opinion, but it looks like Daniel wants to say something. Go ahead. I'll try to respond to you. I think that for many years people have forgotten about the fact that crises do not discriminate between emerging and, and developed economies. Uh, when we had the Great Depression, those economies were the most developed economies in the world and we had a Great Depression. So that's not the issue. The issue is that when, when the crisis hit the emerging markets, they expected to be assisted, to be helped by the IFIs and by, the, by developed economies. Of course, if an emerging economy is a small one, that's fine. But if, but if you have to deal with China, <laughs> that's going to bring, I mean, that can bring the whole economy down global economy down to two. The, the big issue is that it's not like we had uh, an ordinary crisis, like an episode of a crisis. We have a recession in the developed world and then we have a recovery and so on. 
there are structural changes, fundamental changes. Think about the level of debt, both public and private. And, and I'm not referring to the United States where you have, where the economy funds itself primarily through capital markets. I'm referring to Europe, the legacy issue, which has not been solved with. In the euro area, you have not addressed the fundamental issues of its architecture. We have a cyclic recovery. This is not like a recovery which is going to stay. It's, it's a cyclic recovery, which is supported basically by very cheap money. It is true that substantially higher interest rates are not going to, to be. I mean, it's, I think the ECB will be very reluctant to raise, I mean, its policy rates in the years to come. It will deal with uh, the program. The, the unconventional policies will change the path. So, um, if we do not address these fundamental issues, I mean, the legacy, the level of debt, uh, the poor architecture of the euro area in Europe, if we cannot address the issue of income distribution, I mean, think, in recent years, central banks, the IMF, the Bank of England, ECB, have paid a lot of attention to income distribution. This is mind-boggling. I mean, imagine a decade ago telling the top guys at the top, at the head, the Fed, or people at, uh, in the ECB, or in the Bank of England. You should think about income distribution. You should pay attention. And this is not an, an academic exercise. This is very pragmatic, because if you do not have social stability in society, you're not going to have economic stability. If you, if you don't have economic stability, you're not going to have financial stability. And ultimately, I'll, I'll stop on this note. I think we were not addressing major weaknesses. The finance, the way finance does work. We do not. I think we should reduce much more leverage. I think uh, you could argue, yeah, but that's going to be very inimical to lending and so on. No. Banks can be very destabilizing as actors in the economy. The whole of finance can be very destabilizing. The fact that we do not have policy coordination in the global economy, that can be very destabilizing. So what we need is very simple systems. In the military, there is this term. Very simple, very transparent. No portion of finance should be beyond the territory of regulation and supervision. Otherwise, so I think we're coming, coming to uh, a close. Let me say a few words uh, about the question about emerging markets. Uh, all the major emerging market crises of modern, of my modern times, let's start with the, uh, but can we start with the, the so-called uh, uh, Latin debt crisis of the, of the early 80s. Uh, let's go to the Mexican peso crisis, the Asian currency crisis. Every one of those was a reflection of instability in advanced economy policies, and uh, rather than something self-generated by, by the emerging markets. Uh, what happened was after uh, these repeated shocks emanating from the advanced economies, at the very least, the, these economies uh, followed, dare I say it, uh, advice to clean up their financial systems, to make their uh, exchange rate systems flexible, and uh, with solid banking systems and flexible exchange rates, that didn't, that didn't insulate them from broader macro trends, but it did keep them out of the, out of the subsequent crises. So, uh, for example, I, don't, I, yeah, I shouldn't go into the details, but uh, Asian, Asian currency crisis, it, it was, it, the preconditions were well foreseen, the, at least in the private sector. The issue, uh, e.g. Thailand, was, was recognized as a likely candidate for crisis. The question was, what were they going to do about it? That was the unknown. My, my view is they decided to have a crisis. I don't want to bore you with the details. Uh, and they warned their bankers, and their bankers got out of town and left basically Japanese banks holding the bag. Okay, Europeans first, but also Japanese. Fair enough? Yeah, also? Okay. Yes, okay. Yep. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, be, because on the... 
on the official side, on the official side, because the official side didn't see the interconnections that were, that were laid out through the East Asian dollar standard. Namely, you, you well, as I say, I could go on and on, but it's just bore everybody else. But basically, it, to, the, to the official, the, the two things happened. One, it appeared first Thailand, then, you know, then the Philippines. It's like bombs exploded all over here and, they, and seemed uncoordinated. To the private sector, it was, I see the pattern and I'm not going to be the sucker to hold the bag everywhere else, right? Okay. But here's the second part that wasn't recognized and isn't recognized even today, and that is there is no crisis prevention instrument in international finance. That the IMF, which has essentially only crisis resolution instruments available to it, there's this idea that there's somehow, because there's a financial safety net, it's, it is crisis prevention, but it is not. And uh, there have been attempts to create crisis prevention instruments, which would have to be insurance-like instruments in a world of securitized finance. And even today, there is no uh, official willingness to create those kind of mechanisms. And it basically, and under the control of my colleagues here who have been central bankers, uh, that, that the institution you would think of would play that role as the International Monetary Fund. It's viewed by central bankers as a fiscal, inst a fiscal agency, not a monetary agency. And they'll be, they're, let's just put it politely, they're loath to grant mo uh, powers that look like money creation powers to a fiscal agency like the IMF. So that's, that continues to be a problem. On the other hand, on the other hand, in the wake of the crisis, the FSB has acted. Partly, um, number one, the banking system is much more capitalized than it ever was before because even the bankers recognized the system was way undercapitalized. So I think with or without regulation, there would have been uh, increased capitalization. There's been reduced leverage. The, uh, if you remember, the something called the Senior Supervisors Group, hardly anybody does, but they issued, helpfully issued a report in October 2009 saying, by the way, the risk management systems of, the major, of most of the major international banking institutions were inadequate to control the risks that they were actually running. My reaction was, thank you very much. It would have been more useful to have pointed this out before the crisis rather than after the crisis. But now banks go through stress tests of that uh, burdensome, very administratively burdensome and costly stress tests, et cetera. So the notion that the system is no safer than it was before, I think, is, is not, is, is simply to dismiss all that out of hand. On the other hand, what we've heard, I think, on the panel uh, is, uh, first of all, that the, uh, uh, that the reforms are incomplete. Uh, I think there is a little disagreement, Daniel, what you said is something the IMF concluded certainly in 2008, which was that the perimeter of regulation was poorly drawn and that systemically relevant institutions, financial institutions, were left outside the, the uh, uh, perimeter of regulation. Uh, that the, uh, there was a lack of resolution mechanisms. Uh, etc. So, and, and I would say that we would probably all agree that that process is not complete. Uh, as Andre told us, uh, what needs to be done just to even complete the banking union in Europe, let alone to implement the capital markets union, etc. So, does that leave us vulnerable to potential crisis? I think I'll bet everybody would agree. Yeah, it could happen. We're not going to say that we've, uh, we've solved all, the, all those problems. Um, so a, a ways to go. Uh, at the same time, as I say, I think what I, what I heard in general was these risks may exist, and you can even think of triggers that can create those risks, but chances are that the near term looks pretty much okay, and it doesn't look like any official uh, from the official side, there are going to be actions that will upset the apple cart, although, among others, Jeffrey has given us some scenarios that, it, that are not inconceivable, that could, uh, could produce uh, results that are uh, uh, more worrisome 
than that. Now, I invite my panelists, if there are any final comments that you, you want to make that we have, we have neglected, please, I can add. One thing you didn't mention is the limited capability of the Federal Reserve over um, uh, possible bailout of non-bank entities because of Dodd-Frank, obviously. Um, as you correctly pointed out, banks are now more, much more capitalized than, uh, than, than, of course, at the time of the Lehman crisis, but even uh, in comparison to a few years ago. And as I said, credit risk taking has been pushed to shadow banking system. And, um, you know, uh, he mentioned that BlackRock covers 5.5 trillion uh, assets under management. Uh, I'm not specifically speaking of BlackRock or any other uh, asset management companies. But uh, if anything goes wrong, which has systemic implications, and yet, Federal Reserve will be unable, unable to, you know, address the situation. That's really, really a big concern. Federal Reserve is now uh, explicitly um, prohibited from extending uh, credit to non-bank entity. Yeah, I was going to say that. I mean, I, don't say it. Yeah. Never say never. Never, never say no. never when it comes to. Rules are made by people. Well, as I. We don't know where. I wasn't expecting to rule. I wasn't expecting to say anything along these lines, but I think this is not a. Wait, but it's. Yes, but it's subsequently been de demonstrated that wasn't strictly speaking true. That it was a matter of they decided they didn't need to, and therefore they didn't. They didn't want it. Uh, I always. Uh, oh, okay. That's totally unfair. Oh, okay. Sorry. If, I retract that. <laughs> no, if uh, Tom Baxter, general counsel to the New York Fed, he made a testimony to the Congress um, in uh, 2009. And he specifically mentioned a few episodes. And, uh, you know, if the UK authorities told other central banks and regulators that the Barclays would not be able to buy out Lehman Brothers, if they had said that on Friday or Saturday, then the situation would have been very different from what actually happened. But the UK authorities said at the last moment, Sunday, that was too late. Yeah, yeah. It have collapsed anyway, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. At the point of rupture. But AIG created Spain. That's right. Um, yeah. You know, for AIG, Federal Reserve created Made in, made in Lane 2, two. Uh, made and in lane 3. One was Bear Stearns. Yeah, Bear Stearns at the time. My, what I would say is when, when uh, the Secretary of the Treasury asks his deputy, what's my downside here? If we don't act, what's the worst that could happen? And the deputy says, Mr. Secretary, I have no idea, but it could be the end of the earth. Uh, then astonishing amount of other people's money becomes available so we don't find out what the downside is but uh, but but that's but that's no way that's no way to run a railroad or a uh, or a financial system so let it let us hope but as I say I, it, my guess is even today most people think the for example the IMF is the systemic fireman and that it must have tools to prevent fires and the answer is no. They only have tools to put out fires after they've broken out, and not enough. And not enough of them. Correct. In fact, it was. Well, wait. It, the other way around. It was set up because of the Great Depression. 
but we did have a great recession. At any rate, guys, thanks very much. Thank you all. Very administratively burdensome and costly stress test, etc. So the notion that the system is no safer than it was before, I think, is is not is is simply to dismiss all that out of hand. On the other hand, what we've heard, I think, on the panel uh, is, uh, first of all, that the uh, uh, that the reforms are incomplete. Uh, I think there is a little disagreement, Daniel. What you said is something the IMF concluded certainly in 2008, which was that the perimeter of regulation was poorly drawn and that systemically relevant institutions, financial institutions, were left outside the, the uh, uh, perimeter of regulation, uh, that the, uh, there was a lack of resolution mechanisms, uh, etc. So. And, and I would say that we would probably all agree that that process is not complete. Uh, as Andre told us, of what needs to be done just to even complete the banking union in Europe, let alone to implement the capital markets union, et cetera. So does that leave us vulnerable to potential crisis? I think I'll bet everybody would agree, yeah, it could happen. We're not going to say that we've, uh, we've solved all, the, all those problems. Um, so. Uh, a ways to go. Uh, at the same time, as I say, I think what I what I heard in general was these risks may exist, and you can even think of triggers that could create those risks. But chances are that the near term looks pretty much okay, and it doesn't look like any official uh, from the official side there are going to be actions that will upset the apple cart. Although, among others, Jeffrey has given us some scenarios that, it, that are not inconceivable, <laughs> that could, uh, could produce uh, results that are, are uh, more worrisome than that. Now, I invite my panelists, if there are any final comments that you, you want to make that we have, we have neglected, please, I can argue. One thing you didn't mention is the limited capability of the Federal Reserve over um, a possible bailout of non-bank entities because of Dodd-Frank, obviously. Um, as you correctly pointed out, banks are now more, much more capitalized than um, and of course, at the time of the Lehman crisis, but even uh, in comparison to a few years ago. And as I said, credit risk taking has been pushed to shadow banking system. And, um, you know, uh, he mentioned that BlackRock covers 5.5 trillion uh, assets under management. Uh, I'm not specifically speaking of BlackRock or any other uh, asset management companies. But uh, if anything goes wrong, which has systemic implications, and yet Federal Reserve will be unable, unable to you know, address the situation, that's really, really a big concern. Federal Reserve is now uh, explicitly um, prohibited from extending uh, credit to non-bank entity. Yeah, I was going to say that. I mean, I, don't say it. Yeah. Never say never. Never, never say never when it comes to. Rules are made to be broken. Rules are made by people. Well, as I. Wait, but it's, yes, but it's subsequently been de demonstrated that wasn't strictly speaking true. That it was a matter of they decided they didn't need to, and therefore they didn't, they didn't want to. It, uh, I always, uh, oh, oh. That's totally unfair. Oh, okay, sorry. If, I retract that. <laughs> uh, no, if uh, Tom Baxter 
general counsel to the New York Fed, he made a testimony to the Congress um, in uh, 2009, and he specifically mentioned a few episodes. And, uh, you know, if the UK author authorities told other central banks and regulators that the <coughs> Barclays will not be able to buy out Lehman Brothers, if they had said that on Friday or Saturday, then f the situation would have been very different from what actually happened. But the UK authorities said at the last moment, Sunday, that was too late. Then you would have AIG, and I mean, the situation would have collapsed with somebody else. So yeah, yeah. It would have collapsed anyway, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At the point of uh, rupture. But I mean, AIG created a major lane. That's right. Um, yeah. You know, for AIG, Federal Reserve created Made in, made in Lane 2, two. and, and lane 3. Lane 1 was Bear Stearns. Yeah, Bear Stearns yeah. at the time. My, what I would say is when, when uh, the Secretary of the Treasury asks his deputy, what's my downside here? If we don't act, what's the worst that could happen? And the deputy says, Mr. Secretary, I have no idea, but it could be the end of the earth. Uh, then astonishing amount of other people's money becomes available, so we don't find out what the downside is. But uh, but but that's but that's no way that's no way to run a railroad or a uh, or a financial system. So let it, let us hope. But as I say, uh, it, my guess is even today most people think the for example the IMF is the systemic fireman, and that it must have tools to prevent fires. And the answer is no. They only have tools to put out fires after they've broken out, and not enough. And not enough of them. Correct. In fact, it was. Well, wait. It, the other way around. It was set up because of the Great Depression. But we did have a Great Recession. At any rate, guys, thanks very much. Thank you all.